good morning. I propose to present Marco's title in three parts. Editor's Nightmare, Poor Paper, Worse Revision. Uh, what do we do, just go forward? Nightmare. The original definition, according to Oxford, that a nightmare was a female sp spirit or monster who is supposed to settle on a sleeping animal or person and suffocate them. The modern usage is the bad dream, dream producing these suffocating symptoms or similar sensations, an oppressive or terrifying or fantastically horrible dream, fear, or experience. So obviously the editor is asleep. Now we go on to poor paper. How do you define a poor paper? This is a partial list. You can't define a poor paper because there's so many ways to be poor. And we know this from life too. So I think this we have to look at a little bit backwards. So this editor, before making a decision about any paper, I ask two questions. Is the subject matter likely to be of interest to our readers? And do I believe the data? Now if the answers are both yes, the paper may have some value. And I'll send that one out for review. So that's how a poor paper gets reviewed, at least in the annals. If either answer is no, why on earth send it to a reviewer? Note, in order to make this determination, the editor has to read the paper. You can't be a blackjack a shuffler and just shuffle the cards. You've got to actually look at the paper. Now, the editor is asleep and did not look at the paper would be one reason to send a poor paper for, for review. The editor is not sure of his answers to two questions. The editor is not sure why the paper is poor. The editor wants the reviewers to decide, to decide because he's got other things to do. Or the editor is awake, has gone over the paper, and has answered yes to both questions and hopes the reviewers will offer ways to improve the paper. That's what the review process is all about. After the reviewers come in, typically one reviewer returns a one-word review, accept or reject, and he's no help to either the editor or the author. So if you're a reviewer, this is not acceptable. Two or more reviewers return opposing critiques which do not explain their rec recommendations. That doesn't help a whole lot either. The cri critiques are critical but not constructive or instructive. Flaws are identified but remedies are not mentioned. So one or more critiques that are constructive or instructive, in other words, they help mentor the authors to turn a poor paper into a good paper. That's the idea. Now the basic elements for mentoring are, first of all, you have to know the difference between a prospective study and a retrospective study. It's actually pretty easy. The study is designed before the data are collected in a prospective study, and all data are collected prospectively, even a hospital record. A hospital record or op note dictated two months later isn't a whole lot of good or very accurate. A retrospective study is a study designed after the data are collected. And in clinical surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, most of our papers are retrospective. It's the nature of our, what we do. All data are collected prospectively, notebooks, hospital charts, office notes, electronic records, etc. So a collecting the data does not determine whether the study is prospective or retrospective. It's when the study was designed. So what are the essentials of a prospective study? Well, as Larry said, you need to state the question that you don't know the answer to. Now, unfortunately, a lot of our papers, you state the question that you do know the answer to. 
I'd like to review our hospital's experience with aortic dissections for the last 10 years. We already got a pretty big literature on the aortic dissection, so what are you going to tell us? That's not too good an introduction. The rationale for writing the paper isn't there. So you need a question that you're going to try to answer. So the paper has a purpose and you provide the rationale for studying this question. That's your introduction. Then to design a study, this is a prospective study, that will answer your question, you're going to have to determine the subjects, whether they're humans, uh, sheep, or dogs, or rats, or mice, controls, the measurements, what measurements are you going to make, are they specific to the a question that you're trying to answer? How often are you going to make them? How are you going to make them? Those details are important. Are you going to get enough samples so that you can do statistics on them? And you're going to determine the primary outcome, which you have to do in order to do a power analysis, and then do uh, the secondary outcomes. And determine in advance how the best statistical model you will use, or the statistical model you will use to analyze the data that you are prospectively going to collect. You do this best with a biostatistician as a consultant. But what about a retrospective study? What is the purpose of the study? You may not have a hypothesis in a declarative statement that is testable, but you do have to have a purpose. As someone answered this question before, you don't want to repeat old news. Retrospective studies describe patients almost invariably. Define the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria, and the years spanning the study period. For electronic databases, you have to define a group of search words that you search in order to get your subjects. And then you want to determine the outcomes of the study in advance. And you can have more than one outcome. You can have mortality, but you can also have complications and other uh, outcomes, good or bad. But determine two, three outcomes before the study, and you want to match the outcomes with the design of the study itself. If you don't have a control group, it's probably best to use a univariable and multivariable regression statistics in order to determine the factors, the risk factors, the explanatory variables that determine what the spot, uh, that influence the response variable. And here again, statistics help you in the design of your study. It's up to you to list the risk uh, factors that you want to consider, but that's where your experience comes in. That's where you come from taking care of the patients comes in, whether they got renal failure or not, makes a big difference to the outcome. And you know that, so you're going to put that in the risk factors. Choose the relevant explanatory risk factors explain each out to explain each outcome uh, variables, and assemb assemble separate risk lists for each outcome. So if you're going to do survival, you may have slightly different uh, risk factors from when you're doing the kind of respiratory complications if you decide that that's going to be an outcome uh, variable. And, uh, use the, uh, and you can also create a control group if you have a large cohort of subjects by a propensity balancing. In other words, you take the bad outcome patients and you match them using propensity balancing uh, to the larger cohort with good results and then get comparable groups of patients, usually of equal numbers. Okay, what happens if the reversion, revision is worse? That's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Hank. Uh, I think uh, at the end, if we have time, uh, we will take the speakers up there and we will have the discussion uh, at the end uh, of the session. The next one uh, paper will show you the la lack of freedom of the editor because editor is not as free as might have appeared from these two uh, communications. Editor's balancing act between association publishers and authors will be given by Ludwig von Segesser, the editor of the European Journal. Ludwig.